Hello and good evening. Um, I'm Tracy Hampston from All Meadows and welcome to the first in our series of online talks that we've got for you over the autumn and winter. Um, we're absolutely delighted that naturalist, author and wildlife documentary filmmaker Nick Gates has agreed to talk to us tonight. And we've also got Robin Teagood um, to tell us all about Orchard Link. Um, just a few sort of housekeeping. Bits, uh, there's plenty of time for questions at the end. So if I can ask you to post your questions in the YouTube chat window um, as we go through and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. Um, do feel free to say hello to other people if you want to stick something in the chat window and say where you're from. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about more meadows for those of you that um, are less familiar with us and haven't been to one of our talks before. So More Meadows is a Dartmoor-based community group of around 800 landowners, farmers and gardeners who are restoring and creating flower-rich grasslands on every scale from large farm scale to shed roofs and everything, everything in between. Um, and as anyone knows who has a, an established hay meadow, they can contain a huge abundance of wildlife and they're really some of our best habitats. Um, we've also have an online communication platform for people all over Devon and beyond, the Meadow Makers Forum, and there'll be some links to that and the More Meadows website in the chat box, I think at the beginning, and we'll pop them up again at the end. And the forum is really where people uh, can talk to each other, um, swap notes, ask questions, uh, share pictures and all sorts of things. So if you're um, not a member and like to join up it's free um, so do um, do do that so our first speaker tonight is going to give us a um, a little run through of what orchard link is all about um, so I want to introduce Robin um, I'll put him up there there we go um, good evening, Robin. So Robin Teagood has been involved with Orchard Link for 10 years and is currently the chairman. Um, although you're now retired, Robin, you've worked in a variety of countryside management jobs, including manager of the South Devon area of outstanding natural beauty. And he lives in South Brent, where he owns a small orchard. Um, um, but this evening is actually joining us from Glasgow where I'm sure you probably realise he's there to take part in environmental actions during the COP conference. So I'm going to hand over, hand over to you now, Robin, and um, go for it. Tracy, thank you. Um, it's to be able to collaborate with More Meadows this evening. Um, Orchard Link and More Meadows have got a lot of things in common in our shared interests. And I'm imagining that maybe some of you watching this evening might be members of both in both organizations. Um, I really enjoyed reading Nick's book. Um, it really resonated for me. I'm going to say a little bit about um, Orchard Link, um, the scene, and so, and so explain, so, Orchard Link is a South Devon based organization. It's really for enthusiasts, um, people who are interested in orchards, fruit growing, cider making. And um, so, I, but why, why South Devon, why Orchard Link? I'm gonna just show a few pictures to set the scene. So I need to hit that. And so yeah, Orchard Link, why South Devon? Um, uh, I mean, Devon was one of the cider, key cider counties of Britain. Um, in fact, Devon had the greatest number of area of orchards of any county in Britain, 23,000 acres in the late 1800s. Um, but the 1960s, 70s, 80s saw a catastrophic decline in the area of orchards. Um, loads of orchards were removed. And a lot of the markets for orchard produce had disappeared so that, um, uh, yeah, so that loads of apples that were left were just rotting on the ground. Um, and there was not only a loss of all the wildlife, but a loss of the distinctive local varieties as well as 
the, de the demand for modern apples became um, much more, well, yeah, much more uniform, much more industrial. So um, in 1989, an organization, a London-based organization called Common Ground launched a project called Save Our Orchards. It was a national project and got taken up locally in South Devon with the South Devon Save Our Orchards um, campaign. And Orchard Link formed out of that in, actually it was in 1998. So uh, Orchard Link, we're part of a, a national network of orchard organizations what do we do this is our website so we've got um a, a range of different things we do and that we offer our members any membership is open to anybody and um so one of the things we do is we run lots of training courses on how to manage orchards things like um pruning grafting vegetation management cider making all those kinds of things and just about we're just about to launch our winter program of pruning courses we also run events like this like talks by zoom and meetings as well um, we've got a equipment which we hire out to our members for apple pressing this is our biggest apple press we've got lots of other equipment as well which our members hire for pressing and pasteurizing um, We've got a thing called Harvest Line, which is like a swap shop for members who've got either have got apples to spare or who want to get hold of apples. So that's a free online um, yeah, swap, swap service on our website. Um, we support a load of um, community orchards as well. There's about 20 or 30 community orchards in our area running apple days, wassails, sales, um, social events all kinds of things like that um so we're very strong on that um and recently um, had a big lottery funded community orchards project um if you're in learning more our website there is at the bottom of the slide www.orchardlink.org.uk um take a look at our website join us if you'd like to um and we look forward to more collaboration meadows and more meadow projects. So I think that's all I want to say. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, so I'm looking forward very much to hearing Nick's talk. And Tracy, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Robin. I know where to come for my press next time. <laughs> we we had a go at making cider for the first time this year, so that's quite an exciting venture. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, thanks very much, Robin. I shall take you off there. And um, I'd like to welcome our main speaker for this evening, Nick. Hello, Nick. Um, <laughs> So in case you haven't read um, Nick's books, actually Nick Gates and Ben MacDonald um, authored the book and spent years visiting a magical traditional orchard and covering lots of its stories each season and looking at the amazing wildlife. And the book Orchard, A Year in England's Eden was really the result of their passion. Um, Nick's talk is a celebration of the extraordinary range of wildlife and ancient orchard supports, making it one of the richest ecosystems left in Britain. And Nick's also going to share how he brought many of those principles that make that orchard such a fantastic wildlife haven back into his small wildlife garden in Bristol with some success, is including the purple hair streak and great crest mute. So without ado, I shall hand over to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for the invite to to talk to everyone this evening um and yeah i'm really looking forward to sharing it so this is um our book uh it's you know now come out in softback it, it launched last year um it's been really well reviewed i hope you enjoy it anyone who's who's read it um and is yet to read it um i've got a bit of a presentation that i'm going to talk through please put any comments or questions um into the chat box and I'll get through as many of those as possible at the end. And um, 
and yeah, if you've got your own thoughts to share, then you know, or you want to get in touch with me afterwards, I will um, share some uh, some contact details to get in touch with myself and Ben if if you are interested. Um, so Tracy, I'm going to swap now to my presentation, and um, if you can let me know when that's up, then I will start talking through it. I think, I'm hoping you can see that presentation there. Um, so the first thing is, just double check. Yeah, how did it? How did it all begin? Um, the the whole the whole book was a complete accident. I I met Ben uh, when we were on Springwatch. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Springwatch. There is a, a role on Springwatch called a story developer, and the role of a story developer is to sit in the truck, um, the the truck that has all of the live cameras beamed to it from around the Springwatch village. Um, so we had nests and halts and sets and dens. Um, and we had to sit for 12 hours a day, um, every day, and watch those uh, watch those live cameras and pick out the behaviour of the of the creatures that were on them. And it was a really good way to, to get to know someone. And by chance, you know, Ben and I were paired together and we struck up a good friendship. And Ben told me about this place that he'd found up in Herefordshire, um, an old orchard run by a some fantastic wildlife farmers. Um, I, uh, you know, I would like to stress the orchard doesn't belong to either Ben or Ben or I. The orchard belongs to um, Nancy and David. They manage it, uh, in our view, extremely well. Uh, it's obviously a, a managed landscape, but it had um, some very special creatures that chose to use it. Um, and so the project started just, we were just visiting to put up nest boxes and find out what species were using it. Um, initially, uh, we focused on a few of our sort of target species that we were really keen to get into a nest box. Um, red starts, woodpeckers, starlings, and various tit species. Um, and each season we went back, we learned more and more about what made a traditional orchard work so well for the wildlife that was using it. And every season we learned something new. And we tried to visit um, anywhere up to 10, 12 times a season, um, you know, during the peak nesting season, we'd often visit, you know, multiple days every week. And then, you know, as it, as it calmed off during the winter, we'd visit, you know, every once or twice a month. Um, but we were hooked with this. This place was better than most of the nature reserves that we chose to visit as naturalists. Um, and we began to document what we were finding. We were putting up, uh, you know, this this plethora of different nest boxes and just documenting what was using them. So we were putting up great spotted woodpecker nest boxes and they were never used and we were putting up green woodpecker boxes and they were never used and we were putting up less spotted woodpecker nest boxes and they were never used and we put up a little owl nest box and that was never used and just by refining over the seasons you know our approach to what we expected to get into a nest box and how we monitored the species that were using the boxes all of the tit species great tit blue tit cold tit marsh tit um the cavity nesting species robin spotted fly catchers red starts um which we were able to get into nest boxes and we realized that our target species the woodpeckers simply weren't going to play ball however hard we tried um they were always choose a natural cavity that they'd excavated themselves, um, which taught us our first important lesson. It taught us um, the importance of deadwood, which I'm going to get to later on. Uh, this is a sort of typical scene that we you, you, you'd find us on over the winter. We would stuff Ben's old um, VW Polo with, with nest boxes that we would have um, cleaned out, rechecked, um, set up ready for a new season. And we'd go back up to the orchards and we'd space them around the place um and we would just you know try and cover the, the orchards actually split into three different orchards but we would try and select the trees and we'd learn you know where the different spots were that different birds favored um and here are some of the successes from the first few years you know we were, we were doing really well you know dozens of tits uh, of different species you know high figures of red starts you know in, in one season we had six red start nests um marsh tits you know a, a really declining tit species um we're using our boxes and we found that um putting up nest boxes in pairs which is a, a well-used tactic meant that the more dominant great tit or blue tit would use one of the nest boxes and the subordinate marsh tit would share the same territory and use one of the other nest boxes um, and that way we were able to keep an eye on nest productivity and we were submitting that data to the bto which is an incredibly valuable resource for them to look at national trends and declines in particular of, of some of these birds. 
And then alongside that, we got involved with finding the wild nests. You know, there are some species which you won't get in a nest box, song thrush, blackbird, um, that much prefer to, or wren, you know, much prefer to use a natural cavity, a natural site and build their own nest whenever possible. Um, and that gave us, you know, a real insight into just how biodiverse this orchard was and the bioabundance, you know, seeing that every single hedgerow that we tapped had, you know, one blackbird nest in, one song thrush nest. We'd go to the next hedge, you know, a blackbird nest, a song thrush nest, go to the next hedge, you know, blackbird, song thrush, black cap, go to the next hedge, goldfinch, bullfinch. We were seeing this bioabundance, which seemed to be significantly higher than other areas of, of farmland that we'd come across. And so it was clear that there was something being done really well here, that these that these birds were thriving in a traditionally managed landscape. Um, it was very low intensity, the orchards, and the species that were using them were there in high number. So it wasn't just one or two pairs, you know, it was dozens of pairs of robins, you know, you know across the sites, triple figures of thrushes. Um, so it was really, really extraordinary to see this, um, this bioabundance and you know go in there and uh you know on a spring morning the dawn chorus was absolutely deafening as the feathered alarm clocks shouted at each other so we wanted to understand how the system worked what what was it about a traditional orchard um that you know really made it so productive we as as naturalists we were looking at this landscape and learning all the time and seeing that something was really working well here. And over the seven years that we studied this, this orchard, we, we boiled it down to three key things that really stood out. Um, the first was that, was that there was a very low intensity recycling of nutrients. Um, the, the second was that there was a high number of predators, which was quite surprising. And the third was that we think you know, the organic approach to the management of the land was clearly contributing. Um, so the first one, the, the low intensity recycling nutrients, what does that mean? Well, deadwood is one of the most overlooked yet valuable resources to a natural system um, that there is. It's, I, I describe it as the fuel for the biodiversity engine um, in, in, in our book. It's one of those things which for so long we've been so used to tidying and cleansing and sanitizing away. You know, if you go to a public park today, for example, it's very rare to find any um, volume of deadwood. Yet if you go, as I've done and Ben's done, to the forests of Eastern Europe, um, perhaps to the, you know, the Polish Birovirzia, one of the most famous ancient you know, forests there is, the volume of deadwood on the ground and as standing is staggering. It, you know, it must account for, you know, various figures show that there's about 30% of woodlands like that can be dead. Um, you know, standing dead trees, fallen dead trees, you know, huge specimens that are just left to rot and decay. And when you think about it, it's clear, you know, that is one of the um, components of an ecosystem, which that whole woodland environment, and um, in this case, the wood pasture environment, has evolved with. All of the species that you know, naturally do very well in this environment um, are clearly using the dead wood. And so, we were we started to study the deadwood a little bit more and find out which species were using it and um, and I'll show you a few of those. The first thing we notice is that the deadwood provides habitat. The structure of having broken deadwood in the landscape meant that species have more nesting choices and they had more hiding choices. So this is a blackbird nest in the you know, rotten upturned stump of one of the old apple trees that the owners could have grubbed up. They could have cut it down and used it as firewood, but in but instead they just left it. The tree wasn't getting in the way. They planted a new, a new tree um, a few meters away that once this tree, the, the dead tree was rotted and disappeared, the new tree would then take that footprint. Um, but for the life of this very rotten tree, and this one lasted about five years before it eventually keeled over and collapsed um, in on itself because the core was completely hollow there. Um, in that time, we found blackbird nests in it, we found song thrush nests in it, and we found a wren nest bolted on the outside in all of the epicormic spindly growth that was sticking out the side of it. Um, the other thing you get with standing deadwood is a huge um, fuel source for fungi. Um, I'm sure as many of you are aware, you know, the, the fruiting bodies that you see of, you know, toadstools, mushrooms and, and bracket fungi like these, these are turkey tails. 
Um, that, that's just, that's only produced to release spores. The majority of that organism lives either under the ground or inside the deadwood. The, the mycelium works its way down through, and that's what's the, the fruiting bodies, the, the things that you see, the mushrooms and toadstools and, and brackets like that, that's what they're drawing their nutrients from, is the, the network of mycelium that's inside the tissue. Um, in this case, you know, it's a, a, a soft rot inside that deadwood there. And that is what other species like woodpeckers need. They need that um, interplay between live wood, dead wood, fungi, and that gives them the conditions that they need to excavate a cavity. Um, but so often a tree like this, particularly if it's any, in anywhere public, is removed because it's conceived, you know, perceived to be ugly or it's perceived to be a health and safety threat. Um, but in fact, trees like this can stand for years um, without causing anyone any trouble at all. And just by lopping off a few of the outer limbs, you can see how that one has had um, some of the, the more precarious limbs taken off it. You protect it against storms. Um, you know, some of the trees which are left completely untouched will only last a few seasons, whereas one like this can last a decade or more just rotting away like that. And then as those rots work their way down inside the cavities of the trees, you you find situations like this. Some of these trees are still live. They have cavities up to sort of 10, 12 inches across inside the body of the tree. Um, and as those rot out, you know, the, the action of insects having worked away at the, the, dip, the wet rot that the, um, the, the fungi have, have created, you then get an empty cavity inside the tree, still with a live cambium and, and producing fruit on the outside of the tree, live bark layer. The inside of the tree is completely hollow and it provides brilliant cavities. In this case, that's a jackdaw nest. Um, and we were finding you know, very good productivity of the jackdaws in the orchards. And sometimes a tawny owl would come and boot out the jackdaws and the tawny owl would nest in one of these cavities. But having that age class of trees within the orchards from very young trees, just a few years old, through to the ancient veterans, you know, getting on for well over a century old, um, they that that provided that diversity of of cavities that the the species that depend on the orchard need um this is a different jackdaw nest so these chicks are just a day or two old um already calling and you can see the diversity of things that the the nest is made of there bits of old newspaper lots of bits of sheep wool um that are all compacted down on top of each other to provide a snug little spot for those those baby jackdaws there the other thing is the a low recycle of nutrients. So not all of the apples are harvested from these orchards. The um, a lot of the fruit is left on the ground. So this um, fair percentage of it is harvested for cider and for perry. But a lot of the fruit is left, and that means that um, mammals such as voles are able to feed on those. Um, badgers absolutely love feeding on fallen apples, um, and then. Importantly, you're providing that conveyor belt of food for the winter thrushes. Just fruit falling all the autumn, stays on the ground all winter, and the winter thrushes that come in and they search across the orchards for food sources like this. Um, these winter thrushes will get, you know, a million plus uh, red wings and field fairs come in from Scandinavia and Alenia, sometimes many millions come in in a, in a busy year um, to feed on um, our berries and our fallen fruit across the whole of the British countryside. In old orchards, um, particularly ones that aren't intensively picked, where uh, some fruit is left to fall on the ground and left for those birds, are favoured spots. And you can get flocks of many hundreds um, of, of mixed thrushes in those old orchards. The other thing that we were finding was that the cavities aren't just used by, by birds. We were finding hornets very regularly over winter, and hornets thrive in old orchards. Um, queen hornets, such as that one there, will find a nice little cavity and they'll tuck themselves up, they'll bind on with their mandibles, they'll bite into the softwood and they will lock themselves in that position and stay there for sort of four months of the year over the winter, the coldest winter months. But before they do that, they will have already stocked up on the, the fruit that's left on the ground. So, you know, leaving a few of those apples and pears and peri pears on the ground will mean that species like hornets and butterflies, some of the larger nymphalid species like peacocks and red admirals and small tortoiseshell, which overwinter as adults, they will all depend on that fallen fruit to stock up on the sugars that they need to keep themselves 
um, fed throughout the winter. Even though they slow their metabolisms down, they need to need those fat reserves and sugar reserves to be built up before they go into their hibernation or their torpor. Um, and there's one of the, the jelly ear type funguses that we that we were finding. The, the next thing we were finding um, when we were looking through this deadwood was an incredible abundance of macronin, big beetles, large invertebrates. And these are one of the species. Um, this is a rhinoceros beetle. Um, the, the, the gnarled textures on that piece of bark are produced by various other species of beetle that all depend on deadwood. And without, you know, the minute you take away, you know, any volume of deadwood, you're taking away that food source for those beetles. And they, you know, they're saproxylic beetles, they're obligate feeders on deadwood. They need it. They need that as part of their life cycle. And the vast majority of their life cycle is spent feeding on deadwood. You know, the adult beetles will sometimes only emerge for a couple of weeks and often not even feed. Um, whereas as a larva, the majority of their life cycle is spent inside deadwood. So when that deadwood is cleared from the land, you're simply taking away the food and you're taking away large beetles like that. Um, this one is one of the ground beetles, which uh, preys on slugs. You know, brilliant species to have anywhere. You know, of course, it'd be very welcome in, in most gardens. Anything that eats slugs is always welcome. So again, a species which as a, as a juvenile will live in this deadwood and, and um, as, and I've peeled open pieces of dead wood before and found the adult there waiting to emerge, waiting until spring um, to to come out from that from its dead wood cocoon that the uh, that the larva made. The next thing we were finding in the orchard was an extraordinary abundance of predators. You know, most places in the British countryside now we're used to seeing far fewer predators. You know, over the years, particularly as a result of persecution. Um, both legal and illegal, um, predators have almost completely disappeared right back to the Victorian Grain Act, where, um, you know, uh, was it Elizabeth I signed off documents that said, you know, you, you would be given a bounty for any sort of vermin that you captured right down to bullfinches and kingfishers. You know, these species were being taken and all the way up to, you know, wolves, um, wild cats, all of the birds of prey, anything that was considered a threat to human food production was considered vermin. And that persisted for centuries. These, these species were heavily hammered. They were hated. Um, and now finally, you know, in the last few decades, we've begun to realize that predators play a really important role in the ecosystem. And one thing we noticed in the orchard was, you know, a huge, huge abundance of, of a variety of different predators, particularly avian predators. Um, the tawny owl density there. If we were to go, you know, and sit out in the orchard this evening, there would be young tawny owls calling for territory. The adults would be starting. And if you were to go in the spring, um, you would hear the constant begging calls of young tawny owl chicks in every different orchard. I think we calculated that there are about six pairs across the site, each producing between one and three, four young. Um, so the, the, you know, the production of, of predators from an orchard environment can be, can be very high indeed. And tawny owls are a real generalist when it comes to prey. The voles obviously will be targeted, but we've seen tawny owls bringing in everything from slugs to slow worms to moorhens. They are phenomenally efficient predators, tawny owls. Um, a very aggressive owl. They will you know, dominate most of our other owl species. And they do very well in an orchard environment when you have that diversity of old trees that give them the cavities that they need. Tawny owls almost always will choose a cavity. Um, they will sometimes nest in an old crow nest or a flattened dray. Um, but when given the choice, they really like to nest in a cavity. So having those big old trees with those big old rot holes gives tawny owls somewhere to nest. And, you know, this is one of the, the branching tawny outlets that I found in the orchard. Just walking through the orchard, you can see the mistletoe there and no leaves on the trees. I can't remember when that was. It was quite early in the season. Um, but fantastic just to see young owls sitting out, um, you know, trying to avoid the attentions of, of jackdaws and magpies um, whilst waiting for dust to come and then to get their evening meal. The other predators that we found in the orchard, there's, you know, we write about it a lot in the book, but the... The sparrowhawks that we found that were working their way through the orchard soon, you know, in our first few years we were there, we were seeing sparrowhawks quite regularly. They soon disappeared and just stayed at one end of the orchard after the goshawks turned up. And there was a day 
when we were just kept finding these kills we were finding magpie kills um scattered piles of magpie feathers and then a few hundred meters later we'd find a wood pigeon you know scattered wood pigeon feathers and this went on for a period of of weeks actually and we thought you know there's something big around and we we assumed it was a, a big female sparrow hawk that must be taken these birds um and then one day in spring we looked up and we saw a pair of goshawks come up out of the woodland calling to each other the male flew really slowly doing his um, beautiful mating display where he shows off to the female how slow he can fly flashing his white undertail coverts and we realized and then they talon grappled so they the male went under the female they caught they fell out the sky together and we realized you know we have a, a mated pair of of goshawks here um and the goshawks were obviously um were breeding from from that display and, and in some subsequent years we found the nest and they are you know doing very well producing a few chicks each year um the final the main predator, avian predator that we have in the orchard is the buzzard. And the buzzards do a very good job of keeping the jackdaw numbers in check. You've probably seen corvids going over and mobbing um, buzzards. And most of the time, buzzards just put up with it. You'll see the jackdaws going after them and the buzzards will just sort of flick a wing and glide. But one time I was sitting watching a buzzard and it glided across and the whole flock of about 30 jackdaws went up, including some quite young birds. And they were taking it in turns to sort of peck at the buzzard's tail. And the buzzard ignored them, ignored them, ignored them. And eventually, one bird came right over the top of the buzzard and sort of pecked its back. And the buzzard flipped over, punched the jackdaw with its talons, flipped back over, holding the jackdaw, which was now in its death throes, dropped it and carried on flying. The jackdaw colony went berserk. All of them followed this dead jackdaw down to the ground. But that taught, obviously, that young jackdaw and the ones that were watching that not to mess with a buzzard. They... Although they can look quite sedate and they'll spend a lot of their time just sitting on posts and in the winter eating worms and things when they want to, jackdaws can be extremely efficient hunters. One of the other predators that we found in the orchard, not directly, but as a result of some work done by the Vincent Wildlife Trust, was that polecats um, are doing very well in Herefordshire. Sadly, this one obviously is not. We found this one just around the corner from the orchard. It had been hit on the road. Um, and over the seven years that we went up to the orchard, we found polecats hit on the road three times. Um, it's always sad to see an animal hit on the road, but it does give you an indication as to the, the density of a species in an area when you're seeing lots of roadkill. Um, and it was clear that polecats were doing well there. And the work of the, um, the Vincent Wildlife Trust has shown that old traditional orchards, particularly with the associated old farm buildings and log piles and the rabbit population and vole population and rat population that you often find in those areas, that is a fantastic opportunity for, for a polecat to come and find a really good den site and lots of available food. So those areas tend to be used by female polecats to breed. Um, one of the most surprising things we found, I was looking at some interesting footprints that the owner had, had sent me and I set up a trail camera um, thinking that we might have um, you know, a, a polecat visiting the orchard turned out that it was um, an otter, we, an otter which was well away from the main river. This is this looks like a river. This is just a small stream. It's an ephemeral stream that only floods in the winter. Um, this was in February. The ponds had filled up in the woodland. This stream went round the back of the orchards and about half a mile further down this stream, um, it, it joined the main river. This confluence is completely dry for much of the year. But the, the, the pond in the woodland was being used by frogs to spawn. And this, we think that this otter was working its way up this stream um, and must have been able to smell the spawning frogs because otters love raiding frog spawning areas. There were other predators that we found. We once saw a stoat working its way up the trees, raiding nests. Um, it was going in every old woodpecker hole looking for chicks. There's a very large badger set to the south um, east of the site. There are regular hedgehog sightings that the owners keep us informed about. Um, and in the summer when the hobbies come in, we see them hunting um, swallows. Uh, over the orchards. So it was clear that this orchard was providing, you know, just by having this high number of predators, it was clear that there was a really successful food chain going on here. The next, the next point that was really clear and, you know, is probably completely self-evident is how important a, a, a you know, low input organic approach is to the quality of biodiversity supported by any landscape. Um, there are no inputs that go into this land whatsoever. It is a completely organic orchard. And that was, you know, really evident by the number of in insects that we were finding. Um, again, it's a common story. Insect numbers are collapsing with all of the available science is showing that insect numbers are collapsing. 
Um, this is, you know, a headline from the Guardian in 2019, but the, you know, it doesn't take much research to just find data from across the world from most insect populations that are being studied. Our insect numbers um, and insects outweigh humans on Earth by 17 times, you know, in terms of biomass. Insects are really important. They are the foundation of so many of our food chains. Um, but that particular journal, um, that particular paper published in, in Biological Conservation says intensive agriculture is the main driver of insect declines, um, particularly the heavy use of pesticides. So in environments that have you know, no, in, no pesticide input, you, um, and again, we write about this in the book and you can go to these landscapes such as to a traditional orchard or you know, if you visit much of Eastern Europe, um, you will see what an extensive low input landscape looks like just in terms of the bioabundance um, uh, as well as the diversity of, in, of, of, of insects. And it, again, it was finding those large insects um, that, that was really clear to us that this was a, um, a system that was working. The beetle on the left there is a, uh, a rhinoceros beetle again, and the, and the caterpillar tucked into the apple leaves there on the right is an eyed hawk moth. Um, you know, hawk moths are some of our most spectacular moth species, um, but eyed hawk moths feed particularly on malice, you know, apple species. Um, and there's, there's clear um, and that's what the adult looks like, this huge moth with beautiful um, spots on its underwings. Um, and it's only by having, you know, low intensity uh, environments where these species can breed with, with no pesticide inputs, that the, you allow your caterpillars, and you know, this caterpillar gets to about four inches long, they're massive, um, that it will allow it to, the, the space to breed and you end up with beautiful species like that. And it's important that we have those large insects in a landscape because it makes it much easier for the birds, mammals, um, and, and other insects in, in some cases that feed on these to get a good meal. If, if the size class of the insects, as well as the biomass is decreasing, it makes it much harder for species like bats, for example, to go out and find a good meal if they're constantly relying on just eating mosquitoes or the tiny little micromoths. Um, and, and, and along to that, we were finding really rich soils, you know, full of crane flies. I can remember evenings where I was out there with a torch watching the ground just writhe as all of these crane flies emerge from it. Um, the meadow in the winter underneath the trees, if you were to pull up a clump of the, the grass, it would be full of different moth caterpillars. Um, and the worm numbers were clearly very high, judging by the, the rate at which thrushes were feeding their chicks. Um, this is a, a vapor moth that, that I found, you know, one of the trees um, on the edge of the meadows uh, that surround the orchard. Uh, again, you know, we, we have thousands, I think about 3000 different macro and micro moth species in, in the UK. We've got about 60 species of butterfly. You know, we only get those species where their food plants grow. Um, you will only get them you'd only get a good population of them if they, if they well, the caterpillars have got something to eat. So by providing that diversity of different environments around the orchards um, meant that we would, and, and also having no pesticide inputs meant that we were seeing some phenomenal species. On, on every trip we go up there, we will find an interesting caterpillar just by chance without even looking for them. Um, and and the, the final big bug that we were finding, the may bugs, the cockchafers, uh, we were taking light traps on there. We were sometimes getting double figures of, of cockchafers in the light traps. Cockchafers are one of those species that, again, spend the majority of their life underground. Um, the grub is quite large. It's sort of a waxy white colour. Um, you might have found them when digging up the garden. They eat roots and things. Um, but again, on a, on a good warm um, evening in, in May, you'll often see huge numbers coming up out of a, a low intensity grassland. Um, a really, really important species for, for birds and larger bats. So alongside studying the orchards, we also spent time taking photos. And I, I have a, a real passion for photography. Um, and I started developing techniques to get wide angle shots of the species in their habitats to try and show how those animals were using their landscape. And the first shot, the very first shot I ever got was, was this. It was not, a, not in an orchard tree. It was at the orchard in one of the, the non-natives. Um, it was a missile thrush, slightly out of focus, feeding its chicks. But that got me hooked on the idea of being able to get a camera to showcase the lives of the species that were using the orchard. Um, so I'm gonna give a bit of an overview as to what we found across the year and some of the highlights that we particularly enjoyed finding across an orchard year. Spring is undoubtedly 
um, it has to be my favourite time of year at the Orchard. It's when it really comes alive. The sound, um, as I mentioned earlier, of the Orchard in spring, the dawn chorus is absolutely spectacular um, with all of these different species working to proclaim their territories and announce to their mates that they're the, the, the best territory in town. And, you know, they're not wrong. So, you know, the, the, the quality of the territories there, I've seen song thrushes get away three broods um, in the same nest in a single season um, at this orchard. It's, you know, four chicks in out, lays eggs again in the same camp, in the same um, mud bowl, mudline nest, four chicks. And it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant to see um just how well these these birds are doing um and, but we the original reason for studying the orchard was to look at some of the rarer species that we use in the orchard this is a red start um carrying a false click beetle in its beak there um and the you know the red starts and the spotted fly catches you know real rare rarities you know across the wider british landscape now um seem to be thriving in this orchard so a few of the highlights that we found in spring. The first thing that comes out in spring that we really notice is the blossom. And as soon as that blossom comes out, the um, the whole the whole sound of the of the orchard changes because it begins to attract the bees. And there are days I can remember going up on a on a March morning when the you know late March when the um, the willows have, are out and the, uh, the blackthorns just starting. Um, and the well, the blackthorn comes out in April, and the hawthorn starting. Um, when the the the, the sound of a, a sallow bush, or a, or even a little bit later in the season when the hazel's out, the sound of a hazel bush. All of those bumblebees that have come out from hibernation, they're really hungry. They need that early nectar flow. So so March and April are really important months for um, for our invertebrates, which have spent time underground. So this would have been a queen a tree bumblebee. She would have come out from hibernation her fat reserves would have been very low the first thing she needs to do when she comes out on a warm first warm spring day is to go and find nectar and she will beeline straight for the trees there are a few flowers out which i'll get to at that time of year but it's the trees that provide the bulk of the nectar and pollen for species at that time of year and they really kick off the nectar flow across the year um, and obviously the meadows take over once you get you know into into may but for for march and april the, the trees are providing that really vital pollen and nectar um, and the bulb species begin to come up. So this is the woodland adjacent to the orchard. Um, the, the bluebells have started to come up. The wood anemones are starting to come up. Um, and then you have some primroses there. And the first, the first flower that we really notice um, to come up in spring is the, the cuckoo flower. So this is um, a really, really important species for one particular butterfly. And if you can see um, in the middle, in the middle picture, uh, there's a little orange egg on the left hand side of the flower there. And on the right hand picture, there is a little caterpillar. And that is the, 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 cat, the egg and the caterpillar of the orange tip butterfly. Now, it's only by having cuckoo flowers and it's only by having a wet meadow and it's only by having a low intensity wet meadow that you have cuckoo flowers that you end up with these exquisite little orange winged butterflies. Um, the males have the orange tips, the females are just like the male but without those orange colour spots. Um, and it's only as a result of having those low intensity meadows with, with low intensity grazing in which the, the cuckoo flowers are allowed to grow up that you get these beautiful little butterflies um, emerging each spring to lay their eggs on those cuckoo flowers. We also start to find missile thrushes. So missile thrushes are appalling nesters, dreadful. They nest really open cavities um, just in the fork of a tree or the three-way fork of a tree like this one. Um, but missile thrushes, they'll build their nests out of moss and sheep's wool and, and grasses. Um, and we always enjoy looking for those, but you know, they, they seem to have a strategy that relies on a, a fair number of those nests being predated. Um, the, the, the local corvids, jays and magpies and, and jackals in particular, are incredibly good um, at watching missile thrushes, finding where, they, where they're nesting. Um, and eventually the missile, the missile thrushes will sometimes change tack and they'll go higher up into the trees, often into the base of clumps of mistletoe um, and relocate their nests there, having lost a few too many nests in, a uh, few too many nestlings in, in situations like this. Um, uh, this is actually a song thrush nest that had nested inside an old missile thrush nest inside an old ball of mistletoe. 
So there is a there is a debate around how much mistletoe you should have in an old orchard, which I'll save for another day. Um, but generally, by allowing some mistletoe to um, persist in an old orchard, you are creating spaces in which birds will nest. And I've found blackbird, song thrush, mistle thrush, and wren nests all within balls of mistletoe. So it's an important species. And later in the winter, it provides for the winter thrushes who eat the berries. Um, this is a nuthatch that we found, again, a cavity nesting species. They will modify the entrance to their hole using mud. Um, and we've spent some fantastic time with nuthatches in the orchard. You, know, you often see them in woodlands nesting very high up. Um, in the orchard, we were finding them nesting just a couple of metres, you know, sometimes five foot off the ground if, if there was the right cavity there for them. Um, and this is the male passing a large grub that he will have found by rooting in underneath loose bark. Um, to give to one uh, to give to his mate who had chicks inside the nest there. Um, blue tits do very well in, in any area where you have cavities, but in the orchards they absolutely thrive. They were getting away broods of ten chicks sometimes. There was a steady um, a steady flow of, ca of caterpillars and small spiders and things coming into the chicks. Um, and again, they would find all sorts of cavities. Almost every small cavity was taken up um, by a blue tit, a great tit, or a marsh tit um, during the nesting season. The, the next species that we really wanted to find were the woodpeckers. As I mentioned earlier, we were dreadful at being able to get woodpeckers into our nest boxes, but we found a real successful technique of finding their nest. Um, the rocks would always um, be the more dominant species in an orchard. They are the real the real bullies in the orchard. They are very dominant over green woodpeckers and over um, over lesser spots. Um, and the best way to find them is actually just to walk the orchard and listen for this very loud um, kecking sound that the chicks do when they're getting quite large. And and we we probably find between three and four great spot nests each year in the orchards. Great spots have a really interesting story with starlings. You know, the national decline in starlings is well documented. Um, one of the main reasons that starlings are declining is a lack of food. One of the main things they feed their chicks are crane fly larvae, uh, leather jackets. Um, as many of you are meadow owners will know, you know, leather jackets are um, considered a pest in grasslands because they eat grass roots. Um, traditionally managed meadows can be fantastic for leather jackets and, and starlings can thrive being able to find lots of food in them. But unfortunately, due to intensive pasture, um, the use of pesticides on those, and particularly the dung that the, um, the pasture animals are pooping out onto the ground containing avermectins, um, the, the soil invertebrate biomass is collapsed in many of those pasture-driven systems. And that's meant that, that starlings just can't find enough food for their chicks, their nest productivity goes down, and the, 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 net, the net numbers of starlings in, in the UK are collapsing. One of the big problems with that is that starlings are actually really bullish. You know, one of the few species that great spots are subordinate to are starlings. And starlings new, used to nest almost exclusively in, uh, in tree cavities. So great spotted woodpecker holes are a fantastic place if you're a starling to raise a family. And what used to happen when we had a really high starling population and lots of tree nesting um, and, lo and lots of areas where they were overlapping with um, great spotted woodpeckers is they'd wait for a great spotted woodpecker to almost finish nesting and the starlings would go in and go, thanks very much, boot them out at the last minute. And the, the great spotted woodpeckers were very unlikely to have a successful nesting season. And that meant that the starlings did well. They, they, they got the free cavity excavated by the great spots. The great spot numbers were held in check. And because great spots are a predator of lots of the different cavity nesting species, that meant that other species um, weren't predated to as high a degree as they are now. But now great spot numbers are booming and that's having a real knock on impact. This is a picture of a great spot holding in its beak the body of a great tit chick, which it has hammered out of its nest cavity. Um, it will stick the great spot chick into a, cavity, into a, a wedge in a piece of wood it will then pull off the wings, pull off the head, pull off the legs and feed them to its large chicks one piece at a time. That's a really important part of the great spot breeding cycle because it gives those great spot chicks the protein shot that they need to develop into healthy young um, fledged chicks. But obviously, if the great spot in the population gets too high, that can have a really important um, knock on impact on the uh, the chicks and of the great tits, blue tits, tree creepers, nut hatches in cases. Um, and importantly, the lesser spotted woodpeckers, which are doing very poorly indeed. 
And we've had years where the great spots did indeed hammer into our lesser spotted woodpecker nests um, and kill the lesser spot chicks to feed to their own. So, oh, and, and this is a wren. We're finding loads of loads of wrens in the orchards. Um, they love to nest, you know, build a ball of moss and they'll nest, tuck it into a pit patch of ivy. Um, the the summer is um, so that we're sort of the spring morphs into um, into the the summer very you know there's just one continuous season in the orchard, um, but the the few species that really start to appear uh, in in the summer are the, the spotted fly catchers. They've flown all the way from sub-Saharan Africa. They work their way up across the Mediterranean, up through France, and the same fly catchers have been nesting in the same cavities sometimes for the entire period that we've been studying at the orchard. In fact, for six years, one female came back to the same brick cavity um, uh, that we had uh, in in one of the one of the sites, one of the buildings that borders the orchard. So it was a um, amazing to see that this tiny little bird, which we knew was migrating south of Sahara, um, was getting back to exactly the same spot in in the orchard that we were studying every year. And sadly, last year she didn't come back, and one of her chicks chose not to nest in the brick either. So um, that's that's again representing a, a national decline in in those migratory species, which is probably reminiscent of a wider problem, you know, even over the top of you know, decline of prey in the UK, um, that's possibly a climate driven change. Some of those species are finding it harder and harder to cross a growing Sahara now. Um, so this is this is what the orchard is beginning to feel like as it moves from spring to summer, the meadow starting to come up. Um, the sound is now the you know, more baby birds fledged around the place um, the apples are starting to appear on the trees. Um, and it's a really again magical time of year because the insect numbers are really starting to to boom there you're seeing that productivity of all of the different components of the orchard come good as the insect numbers end up going through the roof feeding um these species that is the spotted fly catcher that we um, watch for year on year she'd come back to that same brick um either her or one of her daughters or one of her sons would be nesting in that brick um little tiny nest there would, would fledge chicks from it each year um, and we just hope that um one of them will go back to that because it's you know that little tiny cavity there must have fledged the best part of a few hundred um spotted fly catcher chicks over the many years that the, the birds must have been nesting there um very cryptically camouflaged eggs, um, very subtle, but beautiful coloration to them. And this is, you know, how the spotted fly catchers will use that environment. They will find a, a piece of ivy against the trunk of a tree and they'll nest in a little cup tucked in behind that. Um, the, the red starts are also back in. As I said, one year we had six pairs of red starts across the orchard. Again, this is a, a species which is doing poorly. It's on the, <clears throat> on the BTO red list. There aren't many of them left. Um, but uh, fortunately, the orchard, they do seem to be holding their own and any little cavity that they can find, um, they are nesting. And sometimes even the tiniest little gaps that don't look like they could support a bird at all, um, we will be finding a red star nest in them. Tree keepers, we call them the dentists of the tree crop, treetops. Um, they work their way into the tiniest little cavities. 14 millimetres uh, can be the, the gap between a piece of bark and a tree that a tree cooper will wedge itself in behind. So, you know, our smallest cavity nesting species um, is, is, is this bird, which will do a really good dentistry job, wheeling out those little insects, which would otherwise be, be parasitizing on the tree, um, or just feeding on components of the deadwood on the tree. But um, the tree keepers will be there to hoover them all up as part of the, the free dentistry service provided by um, by the many different birds in the orchard, but the tree creepers um, are one of my favourites, actually. And this is the bird that um, we spent longest trying to find. The lesser spotted woodpecker is one of the smallest birds you will ever see. Having seen them in the books, you think they're small. Having um, possibly read about them, you know that they're small. But when you actually see them, you realise just how tiny they are. Um, and at the end of the at the end of this, um, uh, I will show you a, a little model of a of a, a lesser spotted woodpecker that I've had made um, by a local artist who's um, that I use in these talks, just to show quite how tiny these little woodpeckers are. But as I mentioned, they're not doing well. You know, possibly five hundred pairs left across the whole of the British Isles. Um, they are struggling. Um, they're struggling for a number of reasons, but finding food and finding nest sites are two of the major contributors to their decline. And 
that nest hole there is is the nest of of the lesser spotted woodpecker. The cavity is about the size. That hole is about the size of a two p piece, maybe a fifty p. You know, it's it's tiny the nest hole of a lesser spot. So if you think you've got them, um, and later in the season, just just check the size of the nest hole there and you know, compare it to a great spot if you get a chance when you get a chance to see them. Um, but as you can see here, yeah, beak full of um, small green caterpillars there. That's the male, the female just left. Um, clearly doing very well in the orchards here. And sadly, this was one of the nests that we saw later in the season hammered out by um, a great spotted woodpecker. Those chicks were then fed to a great spotted woodpecker chick. Um, and that's the problem. If there aren't species in with an intact um, ecosystem, and obviously one orchard can't prevent the national decline in starlings, um, then species like great spots, they get out of kilter, the numbers get too high, um, and they have a real knock-on impact. This is a picture that a friend of ours, Sam Hobson, took of, of a different uh, lesser spotted woodpecker nest in the same orchards, um, which is you know, an absolutely gorgeous photo of the male at a beautiful nest site that they used one year. Um, in fact, that tree there was used by a great spotted woodpecker the following year. It was then used by a grey squirrel. And three years later, that tree then fell down and it's now just lying on the ground as rotting deadwood. And... You know, great spotted woodpeckers will happily use a variety of different trees around the edge of the orchard. There are these massive old cathedral willows. Um, one of the cathedral um, willows had a, a rot that was working its way through it that we couldn't see from the outside. But using its very clever beak, the, um, the less spotted woodpecker obviously found that rot hole and worked its way in. And one year it nested right up in these willows and made an almost impossible, a lovely photograph. Um, of it nesting up in that and you can see how quickly it can disappear you know this is a bird the size of a house sparrow once it flies up into those treetops to look for food it's gone the, the the meadows in the orchard are fantastic and they support so many different species but one thing we really noticed was the high number of wasps and bees solitary bees um, and paper wasps so th there are many different species of wasp in the UK a lot of them nest in cavities or underground um, you can see here this is the early stages of the wasp nest expanding. Um, so there is a paper wasp nest inside there. The workers there, all the females are picking um, picking bits of mud and carrying it out of the nest to expand that hole underground. Um, and you've probably come across that same scenario a few months later where a badger has then found that nest, smashed in the roof and dug out the grubs. So the 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 spring and summer are just a, a conveyor belt of breeding um and as you get into the autumn the whole sort of tone of the orchard switches the the leaves begin to fall off the trees the apples begin to drop um and you get into the cider season so this is the most important part of of the human side of the orchard calendar um this particular orchard used to use um an old stone press um which it would use to pulp the fruit and it was once rigged up to an old motorcycle there. It's an old matchless, I think, um, that uh, used to spin that, the mechanical donkey. Now it's just used as a bottle store. Um, but you can see all the old heritage attached to the orchard is still kept there. The, 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 the field fairs, as I showed you earlier, are a beautiful part of the autumn um, uh, orchard calendar. And I always look forward to their arrival. Very distinctive calls. In fact, right now, you're probably each evening here in the Red Wings. They've just started coming in. Um, very distinctive seat call. Uh, as you, if you go out on a, on a clear night when it's not windy, just listen. And there's probably going to be Red Wings migrating nearby at the moment. And the whole, the whole look of the orchard changes. Once those leaves are off the trees, you can see how much mistletoe there is, for example. Now, as I mentioned earlier, mistletoe is a really important part of a traditional orchard. It provides food, it provides nesting sites, it provides shelter, um, but too much of it can be a problem. And particularly in a strong, windy winter, um, a lot of limbs can be lost on, on heavily mistletoe clad trees. So it is a delicate balance there. And this just gives a bit of a feel. The, the jackdaw nest that I showed you earlier is in that tree on the right there. There were three different cavities in there, all taken up by different jackdaw families. Um, and in some years, there is a tawny owl in one of those cavities that uses them. But there are about four or five trees like that. Those really ancient apples in there, um, which provide those old cavities in this particular orchard. But across the orchards, there's a massive age class of trees. Um, yeah, we've... we've 
touched on mistletoe, but I just want to point out that those berries are a really important food source for the winter thrushes. So leaving a few of them will will give food for those um, mistletoe, mistle thrushes and, and song thrushes and, and, and field fairs in the winter. Now, I was going to chat a little bit about grazers. Um, there's lots of different schools of thought as to how to graze an orchard. Um, some people mechanically graze them. They'll use mowers and um, different times of the year and completely control that. Um, they'll take crops of hay off, depending on the spacing of the trees. Um, but traditionally, orchards were, you know, pre-mowers. They were always grazed using livestock. And there are three species, really, which are used to graze an orchard. Um, sheep, uh, cattle and pigs. Now, the Gloucester Old Spot is still known as the orchard pig, somewhat ironically, because you never find them in an orchard. Um, in fact, doing the research for this talk, I've been unable to find uh, any old spots which are being grazed in orchards. Um, so if you know of some, I'd love to see your pictures, please let me know, because I'd love to come down and meet some orchards which are successfully using um, Gloucester Old Spots as the orchard pig. And I'm going to get in touch with um, the Rare Breed Survival Trust and see if they can put me you know, in, in, in contact with anyone who, are, who is grazing um, uh, old spots under, under orchard trees. And obviously, Pigs aren't a, a grazer as such, they're a rootler. They will work their way under the soil and turn it over, but it still has that same effect of, of keeping the sword length suppressed and creating that variation in sword height. Um, this is a photo from the orchard that we studied. They were mainly using sheep. Um, the sheep aren't there all year. They're pulsed twice a year to keep the sword down um, and create that structure within the grass, which is really important to prevent the grass from becoming too leggy. Um, there's a variety of different species there that are um, sublet out to a local farmer, um, but those sheep do a really important grazing job um, underneath those trees just to keep that sword in check. Um, but there aren't too many sheep that they they ruin the floral diversity in the orchards. Um, other orchards I visited, this is Greg's Pit Orchard near Much Markle, and it uh, uses Herefords. Again, they're not there all year, they're just pulsed in um, for a few, few months of the year, particularly during the calving season in the summer. Um, Herefords are a fantastically docile breed. They do extremely well. This is a, um, a pear orchard um, or pear pear orchard. And the, um, the, the trees here, you, you know, one of the common criticisms of having cows as a grazing animal in an orchard is that cows are so large and they love to scratch so often that they will take out small trees quite easily. I was extremely surprised to see the size of some of the trees in that orchard that were withstanding the, the, the scratching impacts of the cows. You know, these were, you know, trunks that are quite young trees still um, that seem to be doing just fine. Uh, so it was interesting to know, you know, maybe it's because the, the, the cows had their calves to look after and they weren't as interested in, in scratching. But, um, you know, for a few months of the year, each year, those, cow, those cattle are grazed in that orchard and you can have some quite small, you know, maybe 20, 20 year old trees in those orchards. So if you've previously discarded cattle as an idea for your orchard, you know, they they do do very well. And go and visit somewhere like Greg's Pit. Um, James and Helen will be happy to, to meet anyone um, and show them, show them the Herefords using the, the orchards there. Um, cattle, of course, are a woodland species. You know, the highlands do very well um, in woodland and highlands. The longhorns do very well in woodland. You know, of all the cattle species in the world, it's only domesticated cattle that have been put out on open pasture. Um, we've sort of created a pasture species out of a, a wood pasture woodland species cattle when given the choice will always go into the woods and they'll they'll feed on a diverse range of species um, and they'll work their way between wood and pasture so, so cattle and orchard are you know very much a match if you have an older age class of tree that will support the um the scratching efforts when they do rub themselves up against them um of course you know this wild wild boar would have once worked through wild orchards and and yeah we we do see, um, and I, I would like to meet um, people using pigs, but we do know across across the world, pigs are still an important part of the of the orchard environment. This is a bit of an overview of what the the orchard looks like, um, and the, the meadows that surround the orchard, both um, within the orchard gaps, such as the orange tip meadow, and around the outside of it, are really important. Um, it was clear when we started studying the orchards that the, the environment around the orchard was as important as the orchard itself um, in providing for the species that are using it. So the old woodland that was alongside it, the, the extensive um, low grazed uh, grasslands that surrounded it, all a vital component of that biodiversity engine, which I referred to earlier. And 
just just one example um the the knapweed you know as you've probably seen within your own meadows some years it just really boots um knapweeds are fantastic for a whole range of different butterfly and bee species um and hoverflies they are really important for your pollinators um one one thing we noticed one year is that um just by having your knapweeds allowing your meadows allowing your different butterfly species you get some really interesting spiders. Now, this is a really rare morph of one of the crab spiders. Crab spiders are normally white. This is the dark morph of, um, of a crab spider that's taken out of marbled white there. Um, so, you know, again, a fantastic species to see just by spending time in the meadow, um, we were able to find sightings, you know, behavioral sightings like that. A few highs and lows across the orchard calendar. Um, finding the lesser spot nests, seeing the otters, uh, hearing the red starts and spotted fly catches return. So, I mean, there are so many highlights in the orchard calendar, but there are also lows. You know, we would be finding nest boxes that have been abandoned, perhaps because one of the adults has been predated, or in particularly hot summers or very dry springs, we'd often find the tit species were just abandoned. And they do this as part of their strategy for maximum productivity. They will abandon a group of chicks, even quite large chicks, and then uh, they'll go and lay elsewhere once the caterpillar season catches up. Really low time is when we found great spotted woodpeckers that hammered out our lesser spots. That's, you know, it's sad to see. Of course, it's part of the natural ecosystem and in a healthy, robust, huge system, of course, the lesser spot numbers can withstand that. But unfortunately, because of the way we've skewed the numbers of great spots in this country, um, great spotted numbers are doing very well. Lesser spotted numbers not just as a result of great spot predation, are doing very poorly. Um, so it's always sad to see a rare species getting hammered. And there were so many surprises across the seasons. Um, first was that great spotted woodpeckers hate nesting in nest boxes, absolutely love to smash them to smithereens, use them as drumming posts. All, all of them uh, within a few by great spotted woodpeckers. So uh, we've actually now switched to using woodcrete, this sort of concrete um, and, and wood chip blend nest boxes to to reduce the number that the, the woodpeckers are able to smash open some really interesting behavioral observations we once found um, an egg in the middle of a jackdaw nest in one of the cavities and we thought you know who's this belong to did some research and found that the cavity nesting duck species um, are prolific egg dumpers uh, and we have a good population now of feral mandarin ducks in the uk we had mandarin ducks nesting in one of the cavities um, in the adjacent orchard to this and she uh, she must have been going around egg dumping in any nest she could find and happened to try and dump one of her eggs in a um, in a jackdaw nest. Obviously, that egg didn't stand much chance of getting fast hatching because a jackdaw finding a duckling is probably going to um, going to attack it. But it might have been incubated for a few days um, before the duckling probably would have uh, succumbed to starvation. We were often finding, you know, particularly as we started to mix up where our nest boxes went and we found that birds will often use very low nest, nest boxes, we were often finding mice um, in our nest boxes. So you'd have a you know, nest box that might have been nested for a few years in by a pair of marsh tits and then a, a mouse would move in. And often these were, these were yellow neck mice. Herefordshire is one of the UK strongholds for yellow neck mice. Yellow neck mice are much larger than wood mice. Bright yellow collar, um, very pretty species really big bullish mouse and um, sometimes we'd find pairs of them snuggled up in our nest box real cute species to find and we occasionally also found hazel door mice in them but it was more from the the yellow net mice that we find in there um this was a funny scenario one year we had a red start nest in there and the Herefordshire council decided that the best place to put their public footpath sign that went through one of the orchards was hammered into an active red start nest so just shows a little bit of the disconnect that some people have with the natural world and where and where isn't suitable to uh, to interrupt during the nesting season. Um, we were also finding later in the season, originally we would take our nest boxes down in the winter to clean them, but we were finding um, that in some of the boxes in certain sites, we'd get bats using them. So we began to leave, just clean out our nest boxes in situ, and we'd be leaving them and the vast majority up for the whole season. Um, and the, the bats would be uh, would be using those. Um, so the birds would be using them in the summer and the bats would be using them in the autumn, which was a great uh, use of those those cavities. The most, I guess the the important point that I've always tried to make with, with, with reference to orchards is that they're a, they're a completely managed landscape. It's completely up to, to you as an orchard owner, you know, how, how that landscape is managed. We, we went in as naturalists and found that traditional orchards are phenomenal for wildlife. 
Um, but they're a farm and it's really important to champion those farmed landscapes and show how important they can be for the biodiversity that use them. Um, and it's just, it's completely up to the, the orchard owner to decide how much they wish to share that landscape with the wildlife that could be using it if given the chance. And I whizzed through this, this slide was a, a great tit nest. So one of the pictures I'm most, most happy with um, from, from the orchards and a, a natural old apple cavity. And um, just fantastic to get a real insight into the lives inside these cavities and what these birds are up to. So I decided to take, you know, having spent the, the those years working out what makes an orchard tick, I decided to take those principles and apply them to my, my garden wildlife. I'm a passionate wildlife gardener. Um, I have a small garden in North Bristol. Um, it's on the back of a council estate. It's got some quite good connectivity on the back of it and that it connects to an old railway line. Um, but the the same principles that made an, 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 an orchard tick, I thought, well, all of those are going to work in a, in a wildlife garden. And so over the years, I've been developing my wildlife garden. And there are, there are three golden rules for wildlife, for garden wildlife. If you're trying to attract a species into your wildlife garden, you need to identify what it feeds on, where it breeds and where it likes to hide. And if you can give your target species one or all three of those things, there's a very good chance that if it's got the connectivity, it's going to turn up eventually. So this is what I started with. I started with um, what I would call a blank slate. It was pretty much just a, a square of lawn. Um, I took out the back fence panel. I heavily modified it. I completely changed the structure there, um, the setup of the raised beds. And it was just completely overhauled as to what I wanted to do to try and attract as many different species. And I did that by creating all of those different habitats that, that we found in the orchard, the deadwood habitats, the meadow habitats, the orchard trees, um, one of the first things I planted was my own orchard. You only need six trees to have your own orchard. I planted seven as an insurance. Um, I put in a pond, I put in the raised beds, I put in a real diversity of different plant species to try and attract in all of the different moths and butterflies that would be using them. And I put in a as long a nectar flow as I could achieve. So I got in those early flowering tree species all the way through to the late flowering plant flower species so that I had nectar and pollen in that garden for as many months of the year as possible. And this is what this wildlife garden looks like today. It's thriving um, and I'm always surprised that in a little small patch of, of urban Bristol, the, the diversity of species that come in each year that find that little, little postage stamp of a garden um, just excite me every time I find a new species there. Um, first thing, dig a pond. Get a pond in, get a pond liner in, really quick and easy to do. Um, in a, in a weekend, dig a deep enough hole that it's not going to freeze out over the winter. Um, that's a recycled pond liner that I've been keeping for years for that purpose. And it wasn't long. In its first season, I found newts in there. I was finding frogs in there. And within a few years, I found my first great crested newt in there, which I was extremely excited about. And the nearest great crested newt pond I could find was about four or five hundred metres away over, over the little railway um, cutting and in, in the woodland that's up behind um, the fields that are up behind my house. So I was really excited to see these terrestrial um, amphibians making their way and finding my pond. And I now have adult grey crested newts in there. I find the uh, the smooth and the palmate newts out in the garden regularly. Um, for the majority of the year, newts are terrestrial. They only use the pond to breed in and to feed and to grow. Um, and so, you know, they will be hunting on land. They'll be hunting invertebrates on land for the rest of the year. And then they'll be going down into hibernation for the winter. Um, as the garden developed, I was constantly learning and changing things within it, um, tweaking sort of what grew where, tweaking how to make a micro meadow, um, you know, and the same principles that you'd use to manage a large meadow I was using in a small meadow. I was using rotation cuts. Um, I was trying to match the species that I planted um, using local seed varieties and I was harvesting those seed varieties from nearby estates so I got yellow rattle in as soon as I could. Um, yellow rattle is a heavy parasite of grasses, does a very good job of suppressing those aggressive grasses, allowing those other species like knapweeds um, to, to grow up through and allowing some of the smaller rarer plants um, to, to have a space to, to produce their own flower pollen nectar. Um, I was also planting a few raised beds. I planted a herb garden. I was making that garden a space that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I could use in the same way that the orchard was a space, a shared landscape between people and wildlife. A garden is a shared landscape between people and wildlife. 
all of those same principles. If you want to grow vegetables, I grew two raised beds. One of them I had for butterflies, one of them I had for me. Um, and it meant, you know, by growing those butterfly plants, I grew things like fennel, um, gave me a food crop, but also when I allowed it to flower, it was fantastic for hoverflies um, and, and the, the different species of, of nectar hunting fly. They really, really were attracted to those um, umbilifer shaped heads on them. I was also finding by putting out moth traps and by finding some of the day flying moths, some really exciting larger moth species starting to use the garden. Um, and I'm confident that they were coming in for the different food plants. Um, so on the left is a privet hawk moth that I caught in the moth trap. Um, as their name suggests, the caterpillars feed on privet, but also willows, um, both of which I had in the garden. I inherited the privet, I planted the willows. Um, and on the right is a, a scarlet tiger there. Um, it's on a uh, one of the mullion species but they will lay their eggs on um, on things like comfrey and hemp agrimony, and then the, the caterpillars, of the, as they grow, will work their way around the garden, and they're pretty Catholic. They'll feed on anything right up to nettles. Um, but again, two really pretty moth species that um, probably were only attracted to the garden as a result of the, the food plants that I put in there for their caterpillars. Um, you can see one of my pear trees doing very well in the back there. Um, in, in later in the season, I, I, I made a, a sky table full of fallen fruit that was a, really attractive to, to different butterflies. Um, and I was finding that, that flies and butterflies and, and all sorts of birds would come to these sky tables and take the fruit that I'd left out for, um, for them. And, you know, comma, another species which overwinters as an adult there, um, feeding uh, on, on, the, on that rotting fruit stocking up on its nectar reserves um, as you as you develop a wildlife garden you begin to realize you know how to rotate species in the same way that you might rotate you know livestock and fields on a, on a much smaller scale and um, there are a lot of species that only produce a flower every every second year it was a good example in the first year it just stays as a small um a small plant on the doesn't produce a flower spike at all and in its second year it produces that those beautiful tall flower spikes those lovely flowers you know, fantastic for um, for invertebrates, and as soon as those set seed, they're favoured by things like goldfinches. I found that um, if you leave those uh, if you leave those teasel heads as tall as possible, um, you can actually top them up. So once they're empty of their nat natural native seed, you can top them up. If you've got a Niger seed feeder in your garden, just bring some teasel in, um, top up the teasel seed instead. Goldfinches love to work their way through teasel heads. Um, to to feed in the winter. Um, I was also putting in habitats for different uh, reptiles and amphibians, as you saw, I was finding those those um, newts out in the garden. I was also putting in slates and bits of rock like this, which were fantastic on old um, brush piles. Um, I was really keen to attract in as many reptiles as I could into the garden. Um, you know, urban urban gardens generally are pretty poor for reptiles, but if you give them the habitat, they thrive. Um, so this is one of the brush piles that I put at the back of the garden. It's in each year I just put more and more vegetation on the top of it. Um, it's probably about four foot deep now and squashes down by about a foot each year. New vegetation goes on. I put warm slates on that. It's a south facing pile and it's absolutely stuffed with slow worms. By giving those animals somewhere to feed, somewhere to breed and somewhere to hide, I've got been rewarded with a spectacular spaghetti bundle of one of my favorite little creatures. Um, Slowworms are a lizard, they're a legless lizard, and they're, you know, not, not hugely common, but if you give them all of the components that they need, you can get a very healthy population. And just in that small garden there, on a, on a warm sunny day, I can now go out and find about 50 slowworms under the slates and stones that I have dotted around the garden. Um, so those are just some of the principles that I think you can apply that, you know, taken from the orchard landscape to a garden level. Find them somewhere to feed, somewhere to breed, somewhere to hide. And it works so well with the slow worms. Um, I also started really improving the fruit diversity in the garden. Raspberries from me brought in wild strawberries. I um, selected a really good variety of blackberry. And um, this one's got a what's that, one of the bush crickets on it. Um, and, and, and that in turn brought it's the biggest surprise that I had in the garden, which was a purple hair streak. Um, I never in my wildest dreams expected to be able to find one of these butterflies in the garden, um, but it found its way in. It landed on the raspberries one morning and I can only guess that it came in as part, you know, having what, what um, just hatched and needed nectar. 
it chose, you know, there were oak trees um, probably that it would have um, hatched from uh, when it was when it was younger. Um, and it probably came to the garden looking for the nectar um, that, that my garden had on offer in a plenty. Um, so it's, you know, by, by creating those habitats, by creating those spaces, you can end up with all sorts of different species. But the, the, that, that one was probably goes down as my favourite of them all. Uh, so that's the, you know, thank you for listening, that's the end of my presentation and I'm more than happy to take a few questions now. So I'll switch back um, and uh, and see if Donna's had any, uh, and, and Trace have had any questions come in. Thank you very much, that was uh, brilliant. <laughs> really, really interesting. Yep, we've had an um, array of questions. So I'll kind of swing back to some of the first ones that came in, um, which was sort of more directed at the orchard side of stuff. Um, so Michelle Grist wanted to know how big were the orchard you visited? You put that map up, I wonder if you sort of had an idea of kind of acreage yeah. and she's asking about how many trees and the kind of ages of the trees as well. Yeah, so there's about 700 trees across the three orchards. Um, the orchards are all connected um, as you can see from the map. And the ages go from First year trees, second year trees, you know, very um, three, four year old trees that are you know, still well within a wire and have to be you know, supported from, from grazers. Um, the oldest trees are getting on for 150 plus years old. Some of those large pear trees are huge. Um, and you know, the, the, the veteran pears in that orchard are magnificent specimens. <laughs> yeah, pears can get really very tall, can't they? Yeah. And then, um, I mean, the good thing about apple trees is they mature so quickly. Um, yeah. you know, apple trees become ancient veteran trees within sort of 40 years. So of all of the available tree species, if you want to get a you know patch of ancient old wood quite quickly, then apple trees are good. Apples are good. Um, there's another question a little bit along the same line. So they look like fairly big standard um, fruit trees. Yeah. And um, got a question in saying, does the ultimate size of the tree make a difference to you know the abundance and diversity of all that wildlife? Um, so we're looking at M25 rootstock, which is the sort of large yeah. tree as opposed to some of the sort of dwarfing ones. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that the um, that the, the the commercial varieties of really dwarfing rootstock, which are actually what I've used in my own garden here, they're fantastic for smaller spaces. But they are going to limit the variety of species that you're going to get in a um you know if you've got a large enough area i'd always opt for standards um go go for those larger trees because they will mature into um larger and probably i don't know the science to back that up but healthier specimens um by being on those those, those natural rootstocks whereas i'd imagine that something like you know on if you had a, a huge orchard area just full of those dwarfing varieties um there probably is a limit at which species um are, are not going to nest below um so even once it's a mature specimen if it's only three four meters high you know that's probably the limit at which you're going to start to see biodiversity drop off i've got no evidence of that so it's actually a very good question that i i don't know the answer to my gut would be that i'm seeing the majority of nests particularly for those rarer species um in those larger older trees that'd be quite interesting to have a look because obviously a lot yeah. of commercial orchards they're sort of planted as kind of cordons so they look like kind of big hedges yeah. really I well, imagine this sort of old wood is probably fairly limited. I mean, those espaliered kind of orchards are ecologically dead as far as we're concerned as naturalists. You won't find any of your cavities there. You won't find mm. any of your cavity nesting species there. They are they're a great find. Um, they don't have anything on them. Um, I wondered, actually, how much in the orchard, in the orchards that you looked at, um, how much sort of tree pruning do they do? How they much do, do the they land do actually, yeah they do do a fair bit um it's it's nowhere near as extensive as a you know a, I, I mean I, I do know of quite a few traditional orchards that are, that are heavily managed where almost every tree is cut every year um so there is there is a degree of um of pruning but it's it's not to the level of um annual cutting for every tree um sometimes a tree will go three four years without any pruning at all um, oh, okay. before, it, before it's cut so it's um it's it, it all depends on the tree and how the tree is growing um, yeah yeah sure um robin aronson would like to know whether you think predators have a positive effect on the biodiversity or 
is the healthy predator population more of a symptom than a cause? Um, <clears throat> no, I think the healthy predator population has a fantastic um, place in the orchard. Um, I think it's it's testament to the biodiversity system working within the orchard that we see that diversity of predators. I think the, the diverse, you, you simply wouldn't be able to support that number of that number of pairs of tawny owls, for example, if the orchard biodiversity engine wasn't working. Um, so you'd be able to support a few pairs of buzzards there. Um, and, and obviously, these species are using the wider landscape. You know, it's you know, it, it's hard to say it's as a result of that one group yeah. of orchards that um, those species are doing well. But um, I think having I've travelled extensively with with my work. I've travelled to some of the most biodiverse places. The most biodiverse places I've visited in the British Isles, places like um, the Outer Hebrides, um, Isla, for example, um, uh, North Uist, those places, if you travel, you, you can drive for a day in North Uist, you'll see eight hen harriers, six short-eared owls, 10 eagles. It's very common to see predators. We've just sanitized our landscape to such a degree that we've normalized not seeing those top, you know, um, managed, top regulated ecosystems. So I think it's fantastic to see those large predators in the landscape. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the trouble, isn't it, is we uh, don't notice the things that disappear because it happens fairly slowly or you don't remember back far enough because you're not old that's enough. That's shifting baseline syndrome. <laughs> shift, yes, yeah, shifting baseline, indeed, yeah. Um, there was a couple of questions around grey squirrels and actually you mentioned that there were grey squirrels in the orchard. Um, Robin was wondering what your view on controlling them was and also um, he's, he's got them in his orchard and seems to find they predate on quite a lot of bird nests. Yeah, um, so the, the grey squirrels in the orchard are shot um, and eaten uh, by... Oh, right. <laughs> by, um, uh, by, by one of the owners and gray squirrel numbers controlled, I think very well, um, gray squirrels. Their only real predator in the orchard are the goshawks. Um, so I'm, you know, as I, th I think with with those limited predators until, you know, in, 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 a, in a complete intact ecosystem, you'd have one of their major predators, such as the pine martin back until we have pine martins back across the, the wider landscape i'm more than happy to see you know low numbers of gray squirrels controlled if they're then eaten i think it's um, a valuable source of wild meat yeah um okay and they do have That's... a huge impact on bird nests you know, yes yes really yes they're very efficient nest raiders Some, yeah something we find actually in our woodland yeah. um so we also had the question about your the lesser spotted woodpeckers that seem to come in for a bit of a hard time. Um, you mentioned that year where they wiped all of their nests out. Are they still yeah. there? Do they still manage to yes. successfully? Yeah, they're, fortunately, they're still there. Um, we always go back hoping each season to find them. Now, this year we didn't find the nest, but I did hear three calling birds, which were at least two pairs um, at the beginning of the season. So we know that they were there mm. at the beginning of the season. I'm hopeful that they bred successfully. They're incredibly secretive. Um, anyone who's had the pleasure of seeing a lesser spotted woodpecker will know just how shy they are. This is how big a lesser spotted woodpecker is. Ah, um, it's made by a fantastic artist called Carrie Ann Gardner. Great, isn't it? And I commissioned this just to be able to show on these talks. You know, you can. This is a life-size model of a female lesser spot, but first, it's actually based on a picture of the very first one that I ever photographed at the nest. Um, so yeah, they, they they do they do still breed in the orchard. They um, they sometimes breed in the surrounding woodlands, but they are yeah just a super secretive little species. Um, and there's still a lot unknown about them. Um, mm. If you're interested, there's a wonderful project called the Lesser Spot Network, run by Ken and Linda Smith. So if you do if you if you are monitoring any lesser spots on your land, um, please reach out to the Lesser Spot Network. Um, Ken and okay. Linda Smith collate all of the sightings that people see across um, the UK each year and they analyze that data for you know how the birds are doing how much they're suffering from predation what the productivity is they lend out nest cameras if you want to get you know inspection cameras to get inside the nest and see what the productivity is um, really good project to get involved with we've been involved with them for about seven years now great great i'm kind of aware we're running out of time um so i'll just uh mention a couple of messages here so uh jill 
Gardner says, thanks for a great talk. You say that these orchards are richer in wildlife than most reserves. And she's wondering whether a factor might be less disturbance by people and dogs. I don't know. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Um, you know, we have very few areas in the in as yeah. you're all aware it's nice that and quiet, that, isn't it? Uh, lower disturbance and um, disturbance does play a big factor, particularly yeah. for those ground nesting species. Dogs, I've uh dog. It, in my opinion, it should be and it, it should be illegal to have a dog off a lead in the nesting season, irrespective of breed, any owner, anything. I think we need to set a national example that dogs can be exercised in dog exercise areas. But the damage that dogs do over <laughs> to ground nesting birds in the breeding season is just yeah, um, and their owners are not usually aware of it either, are they? Yeah. No, okay, well, we've... Empty, sadly, um, sure. yes, yes. Not um, all the time, huh? We've kind of hit nine o'clock. Yeah, all of a sudden. Yes, um, so no, sorry, I do want to thank good. both of you um, so much for. Um, coming along and sharing your kind of experience and knowledge with us as well and also thank you for everyone for tuning in um i just want to quickly mention before we go that we do have um more talks coming up and we've got two in december on the second and the ninth of december um which are all about conservation grazing um so we've got a few speakers lined up and they're going to cover quite a wide range of topics from just starting what is conservation grazing um, how to choose the right animals, alternative to wormers, which is something that you mentioned as well, Nick, wasn't it? Um, different sort of plant selection um, by grazing livestock, plus some great case studies from around Devon. Um, the details for those will be on the More Meadow, the Meadow Makers Forum and the More Meadows website. So do check those out and have a look. So from all of us, I'm going to say goodbye. and. Um, Hope to see you in December. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.